Remarkable Healing Testimonies is our topic, and today we're going to look at a young man by the name of Albion Wyman, who was healed of tuberculosis when he was virtually on his deathbed. Now, the testimonies that I'm sharing with you in this series is to help anyone who is needing healing to receive it. And even if you're on your deathbed, if you're facing something that the doctors have basically said the disease gives you a death sentence, these are testimonies and designed to show you that no matter how far your disease may be progressed, that Jesus has the power to restore, to heal, to deliver, and to save you. The scriptures declare that he is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And just as he healed those in the days of his ministry when he was here on earth, and all those that came to him for healing received it. You can read the scriptures for yourself, or if you're not able, you can ask someone to read them to you, or ask someone that has read them. They cannot find one instance where a person came to Jesus for healing that didn't receive it. So my intention is to share with you remarkable healing testimonies, things that must be believed with the heart, not necessarily the mind, because they're past the mind's ability to believe. Faith is of the heart anyway. It isn't of, it's not mental, it's spiritual. Faith toward God. We're talking about divine healing, remarkable manifestations of divine healing. I'm going to share with you testimonies from years back and current testimonies as I run across them. So for now, this today we're going to look at the testimony of this young man. And it, this testimony is taken from The Leaves of Healing, a weekly paper published by the Reverend John Alexander Dowie. It's dated uh, September 21st, 1894. It was published from Chicago. He says, Today we present Albion Wyman, a dear bright boy of 12 years of age whose mother died of consumption. Now that was the word they used for tuberculosis back in those days, consumption and who was manifestly in the grip of the disease from his sixth year. In other words, from the time he was six years old. Now he's 12, so he had it six years. Able physicians of this city had left him to die when I was asked by his heartbroken father, almost in the language of one of old, Sir, come down ere my child die. I went and found the lad just living and no more. He was in the very last stages of the disease, suffering from extreme exhaustion, emaciated to a painful degree, burning with fever, expectorating his remaining lung, and bleeding from the kidneys. No worse conditions can be imagined, as an eminent doctor whose letter is attached has said. We sat beside his bed and showed God's beautiful way of salvation and healing. Healing through faith, salvation and healing through faith in Jesus Christ our Lord. He listened, believed, and received. We prayed with and laid hands upon him in Jesus' name, and he was immediately healed. The following morning, he ate and relished food, and the internal hemorrhage entirely ceased. The next day, he rose, dressed, and walked about the house. The following day, his father drove him around one of the public parks of the city. On the tenth day after his healing, he went with his brother to Lincoln Park on a fishing excursion. And a few days ago, more than fifteen months after his healing, the picture of him, which is here presented, was taken at Gibson's on Wabash Avenue in this city. 
He is as healthy and bright and strong and active as any average healthy boy of his age. He has stood on our platform in the Central Music Hall, Chicago, and his father has told his story with the lad at his side. And he has done so frequently in Zion Tabernacle also. We present the following letter from his father, which was published in the Virginia Inquirer, Cass County, Illinois, in its issue of June the 2nd of this year, with the introductory note by the editor of that paper. And then we add further the very able letter of Dr. Davison, professor of physiology in the National Homeopathic College, who testifies clearly to three facts. First, that Albion Wyman had consumption. Second, that he was abandoned by the physicians to die. And third, that he was perfectly and miraculously healed. Such evidence is overwhelming proof of divine healing through faith in Jesus Christ. And to God alone we desire all glory to be given. While we are grateful beyond measure that he used our hands to slay the matador consumption. How that word matador, Dr. Dolly talks about it over here. And we'll look at that a little bit later. But he says here, it creeps on solely consumption. Here it is. Creeps onward like the deadly creeping plant, which the Mexicans call the matador, that is, the murderer. So Dr. Dolly is likening tuberculosis to the matador, the creeping plant that the Mexicans call the matador, that means the murderer. So that's what he's meaning here. We are grateful beyond measure that God used our hands to slay the matador consumption. A wonderful cure. Now this is the article from the newspaper. From the Virginia Inquirer, June 2, 1894. Several months since, the Chicago Inter-Ocean newspaper published an account of the cure of a boy 13 years of age, son of Charles E. Wyman, at one time an attorney of Beardstown, his county, and now a prominent and successful practitioner of the Chicago Bar. Mr. J. N. Gridley of this city, who is a personal friend of Mr. Wyman, wrote him for the facts in the case, and in reply Mr. Wyman made a detailed statement of them. And thinking that many old friends of Mr. Wyman would be interested in the matter, we have obtained permission to publish it, omitting only some personal matters not connected with the case. So here's the letter then. Chicago, May the 23rd. Friend Gridley, the newspaper account referred to is substantially correct. As you are aware, my wife died of consumption seven years ago, and her mother died of the same. And my boy, at the time of his cure, was in the last stages of this dread malady. His left lung was entirely gone. Large cavities existed in the right lung. He had lost all his flesh, and he could no longer retain food of any kind in his stomach. Blood freely passed from his kidneys. For weeks his pulse had been running from 110 to 120 and his temperature from 100 to 103. Large sores had formed upon his body. He had been for so long a time been confined to his bed. And he was too weak to speak audibly, could not raise his head from his pillow, and lay for the most of the time in a stupor. We had no hope of his recovery, and his physician could give us no encouragement. In short, he was at the very door of death. Having heard of the marvelous cures affected by Reverend John Alexander Dowie, and finding that they were well attested to, I called him to the bedside of my dying son. He knelt by his bedside, 
and laying his hand on his breast, asked God to heal him and restore him to health. Immediately, his pulse and temperature became normal, and he rested quietly through the night, his pains having left him. This occurred a year ago last spring. He slowly regained his strength according to the usual course of nature. I skipped a sentence. It says, in the morning, he said he felt well, only he was very weak. The morning after he was healed, he ate food and retained it. The first for many weeks. The second day when I returned home, I found him dressed and walking about the room. The third morning, he went with me for an hour's drive in one of the parks near my residence. And the tenth day, he and his brother spent in Lincoln Park. He was for several weeks in the country last fall and became strong enough to take his place in school and attend it all last winter. Some skeptical friends, having expressed a doubt as to his restored condition, about two months since, I took him to our physician, who made an examination and pronounced his lungs sound and fully restored. The doctor says he can in no way account for this restoration, as no medicine of any kind has been administered since Reverend Dowie prayed at his bedside. These are the facts in the case, and I leave you to draw your own conclusions. I know of many other cures having been effected through the ministrations of this man, quite as wonderful as that of my own son. And if you care to investigate this matter further, we'll send you names and addresses of the persons healed. Respectfully, Charles E. Wyman. Then here is the letter from the physician after the father took him for the final checkup. National Homeopathic Medical Council, Medical Council of Chicago, W. M. Davison, M.D., Professor of Physiology, 1333 West Lake Street, Chicago, Illinois, March 17, 1894. On August 23, 1892, I examined Albion Wyman and found him suffering from chronic edema of the left lung. The history of the case, as related by his father, showed that he had unquestionably been afflicted with this malady for nearly six years. On November the 27th, 1892, I examined the boy and found no improvement. And following this, he was examined by a specialist who asserted that in addition to the odomatous condition of the left lung, that there was enlargement of the adenoid glands that the case was a tuberculous one, and should anything transpire to cause ulcerature of the adenoid glands, the boy would be poisoned from head to foot with tubercle bacilli. Following this last examination, the boy was sent to Colorado with the hope that the atmospheric change might be a benefit. During the time he was in Colorado, I received a weekly report concerning his condition from day to day. And during this time, he was under medical treatment as well as climatic influence. The report showed no improvement, but merely the same fluctuating temperature from day to day, the same increase and decrease of the heart's action, and the same ratio of increase and decrease in the number of respirations per minute. There was always present a certain degree of fever, which take the weekly reports altogether showed slight average elevation. I cannot recall the exact date on which he returned from Colorado, but I found upon examination shortly after his return that there was no improvement, and in fact he was worse. And subsequent visits and examinations revealed the fact that the other lung was becoming rapidly involved in the destructive change. There were chills followed by fever, which showed the rapid invasion of the entire lung tissue by the inflammatory process going on. The skin had all the characteristic feeling and burning sensation 
of one sinking under tubercular consumption. The eminent pathologist's prediction had come true. The adenoid glands had softened, the bacilli were liberated thereby, and the boy was rapidly sinking under their malign influence. The mucopurulent sputa under the microscope scope showed all the characteristics of consumption. In other words, they took the saliva from his mouth and put it under the microscope. It showed all the characteristics of consumption. He had consumption, and that was all there was to it. And I gave no hope to friends or relatives. The records of the medical profession go to show that in all such cases, the patient dies. On April the 2nd, 1893, I saw him, as I then believed, on his deathbed, and did not see him until November the 12th, nearly seven and one half months later. Following my call on April the 2nd, I expected to hear within a month of his death. But when I called over seven months afterward to relieve him of a temporary ailment at his father's suggestion, I again examined his lungs and found the right one active naturally, as far as expansion and contraction were involved. There were moist and subcrepitant rails through the upper two-thirds of the organ, and the same was noticeable through the left lung entire, though much less in the lower third than in the upper two-thirds. What was most notable, however, in the left lung was its expansion. It was almost natural. When it was remembered that this left lung did not and had not expanded, to my certain knowledge from October the 2nd, 1892, to April the 2nd, 1893, and that the medical records give no information as to whether an odomatous lung ever expanded or not, and furthermore, when it is remembered that the opinion of two eminent medical gentlemen, aside from myself, had concurred in my opinion as to the prognosis, the question would naturally arise as to how and by what means this marvelous change was obtained. I can simply and honestly say I do not know. Today I examined him again and found both lungs expanding fully and the moist and subcrepitant rails absent. The patient is recovering how, under, and by what power or influence I cannot say that I know. Respectfully submitted, W. M. Davison, M. D. And now his case, after time, Dr. Dowie says, has been fully tested and is placed on record for the glory of God. May God bless it and make it an evangel of mercy to countless thousands. Amen and amen. I know there was a lot of technical detail in that reading along with the doctor's report in the doctor's report probably words you haven't heard before i certainly am not familiar with them but have a general idea of what they were talking about but we see here the doctor's testimony of the condition the young man was in that he was familiar with and then the uh, doctor's report of his lungs being totally completely healed and normal and even though the doctor says i cannot say how on how, under, or by what power or influence this has happened, we know. And it's the power that raised Jesus from the dead. Dr. Dowie knelt down and prayed in simple childlike faith, asking God to heal this young man. And in a moment's time, as John G. Lake would say, the lightnings of heaven flashed, and the young man's healing began and progressed until he was fully restored. It was a process notice. It was a process. So I hope this is encouraging you. If you have any type of lung uh, problems, you have tuberculosis, weaknesses in your lungs, it just may be all different kinds of things. So I just want to encourage you. This testimony has been shared for your benefit. 
God's power is not diminished. And as the verse that we spoke of at the beginning, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Hallelujah. Be encouraged in your faith. Feed your faith. This is intended to feed your faith. And then I want you to starve your doubts to death. God bless you. Thank you.